In the first lecture, I simply described the subject matter of population studies, its scope and what kind of future or jobs you can expect by doing this course. Now, we will go slightly deeper and uh, this lecture is devoted to relationship between population and ecology or geography. There is a difference between ecology and geography, but I have combined the two terms because this is only an introductory lecture and the purpose is to see the connection between population and ecology. What is ecology? According to Duncan, ecology refers to collection of population, organization, social organization I mean, environment and technology. Population ecology therefore, studies the relationship between population size and trends on the one hand, population factors on the one hand and organization, environment and technology on the other. For example, the relationship between sustenance organization, mode of production, economic organization, productivity. Uh, production and distribution of income and fertility. So, economic organization and fertility can be a subject of ecological studies in population, one of the subjects. To quote Poston, a fundamental uh, tenet of human ecology is that a population redistributes itself through the vital processes means fertility and mortality and migration to achieve a balance or equilibrium between the size and life chances. Life chances include the probabilities of having desired or valued resources and conditions, goods and services such as low infant mortality, hospital facilities, education and SECAR. Uh, organization and environment studies are done on a long term basis. They require a long time perspective. One of the uh, most famous studies of ecology is the limits to growth. Uh, the study is about short run and long run impact of population growth on uh, other requirements of life and uh, overall quality of environment and impact on survival of hum human population. Or ecological studies will generally include short run and long run impact of uh, sustenance organizations such as green revolution in India. There was a good consequence of green revolution no doubt, but uh, nowadays we are also facing problems due to green revolution, wet deserts, uh, fall in the water table and so on in several areas of Punjab, western UP where green revolution was a success. What mitigates hunger in the short run leads to various forms of misery in the long run. And this club of Rome study, this club of Rome study was one of the major attempts to study long term consequences of population and arrived at the finding that in the long run the present population growth cannot be sustained. In the summer of 1970, an international team of researchers at the MIT began a study of relationship between population and environment. They studied relationship between population increase, agricultural production, non-renewable resource depletion, industrial output and pollution generation. The MIT team fed data on these five factors into a global computer model 
So, uh, these studies require simulation, computer modeling and then tested the behavior. And uh, the book contains a message of hope as well, although there is a limit to growth that man can create a society in which he can live indefinitely on earth if, if he is important, if he imposes limits on himself and his production of material goods to achieve a state of global equilibrium with population and production in carefully selected balance. So, there are lots of ifs and buts and a caution, a warning that uh, do something to control both your population and your material consumption. In a study of population and environment, population appears both sometimes as a dependent variable and sometimes as independent variable depends on what your hypothesis is. And there is direct and indirect relationship means there are several mediators and moderators between population and environment. Population growth leads to environmental damage directly due to greater demand on resources and also indirectly due to change in forms of organization causing increase in construction activities. Now, uh, there is an interesting theory called optimum population theory. How is pop some people say that population growth is good, some people say that population growth is bad. What do we say? Now, according to optimum population theory, which uh, takes a balanced view of the relationship between population and development, initially uh, a rise in population is good for development, income per head quality of life, uh, no matter what standard of development you take, as population increases, this also increases. Then there comes a point beyond which further increase in population leads to fall in per capita income or standard of living or quality of life. That is the optimum point. And uh, if population is at the optimum level, then uh, it is good. But less than that or more than that in both the conditions population can be problematic. In the beginning operate the law of increasing returns, more is the pop for example, in basically a very low density desert area, if you increase population if through fertility rise or through migration that will be good for infrastructure building. So, there are initially uh, law laws of increasing returns and further growth of population is good. But then comes a point of optimum. Malthus was more worried about this part of the population development relationship. Since factor substitution cannot be perfect, what is factor substitution? Factor substitution means that uh, uh, the disadvantages of population growth can be partly compensated by technological improvement or by expansion of land, but factor substitution is never perfect. So, beyond the optimum point the law of diminishing return sets in and marginal productivity of people starts falling and um, however, the point of optima depends on many factors organi economic organization, social organization, technology, level of income. Uh, and so on. The impact of population growth um, uh, commonsensical, this is uh, everybody knows that population growth can uh, lead to all consumption requirements, increase if population is growing at 2 percent rate per year, other factors remaining same, your consumption requirement will also increase at 2 percent rate per year and you require more of renewable and non-renewable resources. This non-renewable resources is a special problem. Then conflicts and division of labor and urbanism impact depends on the size of population. But it is not simply size of population from environmental or ecological point of view, uh, Alice suggested that we consider not only population, but also two other things affluence and technology. So, total impact of population rise 
on environment or on ecology depends on p multiplied by a multiplied by t. Here p is population, a is affluence, t is technology that is required to produce one unit of income. You may also add some other values, Garrett Hardin's concept of cultural carrying capacity. You know this uh, optimum population may also be seen from a certain perspective as, as carrying capacity. What is the carrying 1.3 billion people in India? Have we already exceeded carrying capacity of Indian resources or India? Or one can say no, uh, we, we can go up to 1.5 billion. 1.5 billion, but what will happen if population exceeds 1.5 billion? Should we not prepare ourselves today uh, so that the population size in the future does not exceed 1.5? And moreover, according to Hardin's concept of cultural, you know, this cultural carrying capacity, maybe in India, uh, even 2 billion people can survive if people are willing to live at the level at which say people of Somalia or Ethiopia are living. But if you want cultural standards of United States, then one can say that 1.3 which is the two number today itself uh, has exceeded the cultural carrying capacity. We should have had say somewhere around uh, uh, half of this population. Swami uh, and another economist added one more thing to this PAT equation and that is um, I equal to M E P A T M and E stand for myths and entitlements means the value system something which is quite consistent with the idea of cultural carrying capacity. What are your expectations from development? Everybody talks of development, but what are your expectations from development? Does development mean that the basic needs of everyone are satisfied or does it also mean that everybody, every family has two cars? It is not possible uh, at very large numbers to provide two cars to each family. Basic sustenance needs can be satisfied. So, th this is culture is another issue. Garrett Hardin, he, uh, he gave several metaphors, several phrases to relate population to development. One he says that we have a th demographic thermostat, people maintain roughly at the same level. If population rises and resources do not change, natural resources remain same, then there will be more deaths also. The deaths may appear because of wars, because of epidemics, because of droughts, because of famines, but deaths will occur and that will take care of and population will be balanced again. If, uh, in the recent past for variety of reasons, some national, some international, this thermostat has been disturbed and people or size of populations in several countries has gone much beyond the size uh, for a thermostat to be maintained and the number which in the long term uh, resources of a country can maintain. He talks of tragedy of commons uh, which means that commons are uh, unproductive and uh, dis disadvantageous because uh, Everybody wants to draw maximum advantages from commons, but does not behave responsibly. So, when you produce a new baby for example, then much of the cost of the baby educational, health, social uh, is borne by society, but the parent you as parents may gain from uh, having a son. Uh, in terms of old age security, income utility, power, status advantages and so on. Nobody considers the cost to society. If you consider cost to commons, to society also, then your perspective will change. Condition on welfare, welfare and, and Hardin also said that 
two things welfare and uh, liberal policy regarding population cannot go together. Either you increase welfare or you increase population. It is not possible at the same time to increase both population and welfare. He also made a difference between carrying capacity of the earth and cultural carrying capacity which I mentioned just now and he, he, he gave the metaphor of live boat ethics that there is a live boat in which uh, suppose there are 50 people and maybe 20 more can be accommodated. For him live boat is the live boat of developed countries basically and lots of people are drowning in the sea around that live boat and they want to enter, they are looking for entry to the live boat. Now, how many of such people can be welcome and on what basis? This was his question of live boat ethics. Then there is subject of population geography which is closely connected with ecology. Population geography is a special branch of population ecology in which population variables are studied according to geographical details state wise for example, state wise differentials in population growth, which states are growing fast, which states are growing slow, where fertility is more. In states like Kerala in, in general in south, south Indian states fertility is low, in states like Bihar and UP fertility is high. So, what are its ramifications for demographic trend, for socioeconomic trends, for political trends? Uh, these are the issues of population geography. Then sensitivity to context of demographic phenomena has uh, led to you know this area or geography also comes into picture because when we look for uh, appropriate policy mechanism then we find that uh, one single solution cannot be suggested for all states of India or all types of populations, we need area specific approach. So, the area appears again as both dependent variable and independent variable in connections between uh, area and population. Population geographers are especially interested in uh, levels and trends in urbanization, urban concentration, the rising density of population in certain specific areas and then rural to urban migration, quality of life in rural and urban areas, city morphology, uh, morphological approach to crime and deviance and other forms of behavior and then regional differences in urbanization and its implications for regional disparities which translates into state wise differences in levels and trends of urbanization in India. Say comparing Maharashtra with Bihar, Maharashtra is one of the highly urbanized states of India and Bihar is one of the least urbanized uh, states of India. Uh, according to one United Nations study, this urbanization follows a logistic trend which means that for a long, long time the level of urbanization remain minimal. As time passes, uh, level of urbanization starts rising and uh, further the re, uh, rate of growth of urbanization may decline, but uh, uh, percentage of urban population is constantly rising and it may stop somewhere near 90 percent, 95 percent. Uh, today uh, if you look at the entire world, then more than 50 percent population of the world is living in urban areas. In developed countries almost 90 percent population is living in urban areas and those who live in rural areas they also have access to all the amenities of urban areas. Many less developed countries are lowly urbanized, they have 10 to 15 percent populations living in urban areas and there is a vast distinction between quality of life in urban areas and rural areas. Now, what are the causes of this uh, urbanization? Ecologists may ask why is population uh, concentration increasing in certain parts? Urbanization being a process of population concentration is caused by all those factors which change the distribution of population 
by size of locality. There are many factors, differences in fertility, differences in mortality, uh, but most important cause of rural to urban uh, migration uh, is the major factor in urbanization. And if you look at Indian scenario, then differences in fertility and mortality also contribute uh, heavily to growth of urban population. But rural to urban population historically in all countries, less developed countries, developed countries, urbanization is caused primarily by migration of people from rural to urban areas due to both push factors as well as pull factors. Push factors are the factors which uh, uh, compel rural populations to leave their native village and move towards urban areas in search of education, health facilities, status, sometimes status, because in rural areas they are recognized by their achieved traditional social status. In urban areas they become more anonymous, so there is much more status equality. Uh, nobody perceives uh, anybody to be low or high in terms of status or caste or community. So, th that is another reason for rural to urban migration. This assumes that the natural growth rate, which is different between birth and death rate uh, of urban and rural areas, is similar uh, if uh, uh, because urban areas have better health facilities as well as lower fertility. This is only an ideal condition. Otherwise, uh, in our country, as I said, uh, natural growth rate is also a major factor, uh, almost 50 percent in the growth of population in urban areas and rural to rural migration contributes the other. But ideally in the past in different countries, uh, whenever natural growth rate of urban areas goes down, rural areas also goes down and urbanization grows due to migration. Rural conditions in flood affected areas are so bad that this woman is forced to migrate to a safer place in some city or urban areas carrying all major, all necessary belonging of her household. This also leads to rural urban conflict. M. Lipton in 1977 wrote a book on urban rural conflicts and uh, he and other political analysts see the relationship between urban and rural areas as exploitative, that urban areas exploit rural areas. They focus on urban rural conflict and ways in which urban areas grow at the expense of rural areas. It's uh, and some of them actually use the Marxist theory of uh, expropriation of surplus value, but in place of uh, just talking about classes, they talk about agricultural categories and industrial categories and show how industrial uh, population or industrialists in urban areas are exploiting the rural population or rural agricultural laborers. According to this thesis, growth of urbanization may not lead to development and growth of all expansion of urbanization may rather lead to marginalization and exploitation of rural masses. We will talk about uh, relationship between population uh, means uh, uh, growth of urbanization and development in one of the later lectures. Urbanization has also produced dual cities um, and colonial policies and exploitation to which Michael Lipton refers. And dual cities, a modern city, in all cities you find a civil line area with modern facilities and a part where poor slum dwellers, those in informal sector or traditional population lives. There is a concept of city primacy that all urban areas do not increase at the same rate. There are some cities which uh, contain a large chunk of urban population and there are other smaller cities. These cities are called primate cities. Bombay in India is a primate city for example. So, uh, dual cities, primate cities in studies of urbanization, we will look at some of these things. 
uh, some new concerns of ecology are growth of slums, informal sector and their relationship with caste, religion, uh, region of origin, condition of urban and structural and cultural marginalization, incomes. In the recent times actually studies of slums have become very important. Health planners, nutritionists, uh, economic planners, those concerned with the quality of housing, water, sanitation, urban infrastructure, crime, everybody is concerned about what is happening to size of slum population and what is happening to these things inside the slum population. Uh, I will not read this, this actually now due to shortage of time, but this shows how um, rural urban, size of population, identities and all these things are uh, related. Implications of further growth, uh, of, uh, if urbanization increases at the rate at which it is increasing, then it can lead to sun of soil kind of demands and um, unemployment is falling. We say that India is passing through a stage of growth without employment. So, growth is taking place, but employment is falling. So, when employment falls uh, and there is unemployment among the local youth, naturally the demand for sun of soil kind will arise and they will say that outsiders should not be given jobs in their city or in their state. There will be stigma for uh, differences in linguistic, uh, for uh, differences in language, in religion, in uh, ethnicity and in caste, there will be some obvious, some, sometimes there are obvious signs of them. People can easily recognize uh, that in the city some people are from other linguistic groups. So, politics of identity arises and as Gunnar Midal say that we are a soft state uh, in his famous book Asian drama, soft state cannot handle the conflicts and violence and problems created by uh, uh, by the ethnic differences in urban areas and there may be more of problems of quality of life and class conflicts. Therefore, the increasing role for civil society. Actually what uh, this lecture shows that population is a matter of some concern. It is a matter of concern to developmentalists, it is a matter of concern to urban planners and uh, the, uh, due to population growth and rising level of urbanization, uh, there is uh, increase in exploitation or appropriation of uh, surplus labor. So, polit uh, this is a political, ecological issues are social, economic, political and psychological and cultural, anthropological. We will look at these issues as this course develops further. Thank you.